part of it seems harsh, and, and so it's one of those that you kind of don't want to deliver. But in the end, it really isn't. Mindy's already given it, actually, in her prayer. She didn't know that, but God has already anointed that. So uh, I love when he does that, when he orchestrates the message in so many directions. So um, I am confident now that this is what he wants us to focus on. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad. All right. If you will, turn with me to Matthew 23. I'm going to be reading from verses 23 through 28. <laughs> I don't know what to do with my hand. This way. Um, all right. Chapter 23. I'm in verse 23. I forgot Donnie's new thing. Okay. This is a marvelous thing, though. I'm going to bring this down. All right. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat but swallow a camel. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will also be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. May God add his blessings to the reading of his word. Let us pray together before you sit. Father God, we do thank you for the power of your word. Father, may it cut us like a knife this day to cause us to look inward to determine that which is good and that which is still evil within us. Father, to be sifted and changed and transformed by the power of your word. May your anointing be upon this time, Lord, that it would bring forth the delivery of your message through my lips. Father, keep me out of the way. Prepare the hearts of your children to receive the truth which you have prepared. May it be custom tailored to each one. And Father, may each of us Look inwardly as we hear these words and determine that which you're calling us to be, that which you're calling us to do, that which you're calling us to change. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now you may be seated. I actually titled this message, for what it's worth, we never put that in the bulletin, but I always put a title anyway, What's Inside the Cup? So my question for you today as a body, as individuals as well, is what is inside your cup? Realizing in this passage that the cup represents the heart, it represents our inner being, that part within us that perhaps no one can see, that character deep within, that may stay hidden behind a facade of holiness or righteousness or goodness. Or kindness. I see the churches of today, and I really have to ask, what is really inside those churches? What is really inside our church? I know last week as we came and we had the cleaning day, uh, this message really started stirring even more because I saw this building sparkling inside and out. I saw us prepared and ready for all these people that would be coming in. And I thought, how beautiful our facilities look. And then I looked at all the smiling faces as we celebrated our anniversary, and I thought, how beautiful the smiling faces and the love that is shared in this body. But then in light of this passage, God really started stirring a question in me, and that is, 
what is really on the inside? What is on the inside of this building? What is on the inside of this body? Because we are more than the building, as blessed as we are to have this building, as much as God has prepared this place. I wonder sometimes how much He's truly prepared our hearts for all that is to come. Donnie has been proclaiming, prophesying, that God is about to fill this place up. And I share in that proclamation, I share in that mindset, that view, that vision, that we are about to fill this place up. But the question is, what are we going to do with that? And are we ready for that? I wonder, even in looking at all the churches universally, if churches are really accomplishing what God desires. Are we really doing the things that he called us to do? I look at the churches, and I hate to say this, often within our own denomination. And I talk to people from different areas, different states, and different regions that are Cumberland Presbyterian churches. But they have become so rigid in their traditions, so rigid in their mindset, so legalistic in how they think, that I hear that people have great difficulty. Churches are having great difficulty allowing for positive change. And I don't mean a change in music style. I don't mean blended service versus contemporary or traditional. I'm talking about change of heart that says, I will embrace whoever, whomever walks in those doors, regardless of how they look, regardless of their skin color, regardless of their language regardless of their previous religious background, that we would embrace. And I I know the Cumberlands are not the only one that struggle with this. I hear it in the Baptist churches. I hear it in the Methodist churches. I hear it in the Catholic churches. There are churches all over that are much like these Pharisees that have become so rigid and so self-righteous and so conformed to their own way of doing things that they really do not know how to embrace the lost. They really do not know how to embrace a seeker and walk them through the path of spiritual growth. That saddens me greatly, as I'm sure it saddened Jesus in this passage as he is proclaiming such a harsh word to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. It's because he knew their hearts had been hardened. So he hit them with a very hard truth. And I look at this body, and I don't think that we're hardened by any means. But I wonder if we have become legalistic at times in our point of view, so ready to correct that we forget to be compassionate, so ready to bring a word of truth that we forget to embrace with love first. I believe that's what Jesus was talking about in this very passage. When I look at those people, these types of situations, I call these the pharisaical hypocrites, the religious law givers who are themselves lawless. We strain out the gnats and yet swallow the camel. Maybe we're so busy straining out the gnats of everyone else that we miss our own camels. There is a false piety, a self-righteous piety that comes in that mindset. True compassion for the spiritual struggles of others is missing. Gentle correction seems to be a foreign concept. We tend to get this mindset of negative criticism. It's my way or the highway. If I don't like what you do, I'm not going to be a part. Or I'm going to correct with such venom, such harshness, that it destroys. Often, These people never give the benefit of the doubt to a fellow brother or sister in Christ. They never see the inward struggle of wounds of a seeker that's trying to find his or her way. They never let the heart lead only the law. These pharisaical hypocrites judge only the outside of the cup, only the color, the shape, the flaws, the decorum, the attire. concern for churches with this mindset. Because of all the places in Scripture where Jesus met 
those who were crying out with compassion, all those who met with a gentle correction, all those who met with a gentle rebuke. This is one area that knew, that Jesus never showed such compassion. This was one area where Jesus became quite fierce, quite angry. We know how he felt about the Pharisees. And so I wonder if in that mindset, if we have that mindset, even as an individual, and these 300 or so people come into our body, are we going to invite them in the front door only to chase them out the back door? How sad that would be. How angry I believe Christ would be with his children. But before we start getting too concerned or, or too argumentative or saying, no, that's really not who we are, and I would never do that. You might do that, but I would never do that. Uh, there's a whole other side. Because I can look at the other churches out there that don't fit that mold, and what I see in those churches are what I would call the misguided missionaries. These are the ones that have such a loving enthusiasm for sharing the gospel and bringing people into the body. But yet, to do so, they become so conformed to the world. They look like the world, smell like the world, taste like the world. These are those sometimes mega churches, not all mega churches. But a lot of times these mega churches are filled with people who are so loving. And yet, they've compromised everything about the gospel. So that the true message of the gospel never truly gets delivered. It never truly makes it to the heart of a people. In fact, even the pastor who stands in the pulpit... Oh, wait. No pulpit. Sorry. No pulpit in those, those churches. In fact, you might see the pastor standing there in torn jeans and spiky, highlighted hair the chain necklace, the open tail shirt. That's the hip way to look these days. That draws everybody in. That makes it feel like I'm one of you and you're one of me. The problem is that sometimes in these churches, the message gets so diluted, so watered down that it gets missed. Sometimes in these churches, it becomes an entertainment. It becomes who can put on the best light show? Who has the best technology? Who has the best music? Who has the best rafting group or tennis group or social group? And we completely lose sight of the fact that these people are coming into our midst because they are hungry for the Word of God. They are hungry for the truth. They are ready to be fed. They're ready to have the spirit man within them fed with the power of the Holy Spirit. And that spirit to be a transforming work in their lives. That the Word of God would empower them. That the Word of God would cause them to grow as disciples. I hope we're not that church either. I hope, whichever extreme we might land, that somewhere God will point us back to the middle. Because I believe it's in that middle that the true gospel can be spoken, and the true gospel can be heard, and the power of the Holy Spirit is allowed to move and transform us and change us. And in that middle ground, we settle for nothing less than truth and growth and transformation. That is what I believe God is calling not only this church, but all the churches to accomplish so my question is, what is the problem with these two extremes? I believe the problem with these two extremes is the fact that churches have become self-indulgent. Churches have become self-focused. It's all about what I want, what I need, what I like, what I enjoy, what I want to do, what I want to say. And that is all self-centered. And even Paul warns Timothy, in 2 Timothy 3, 5, he warns Timothy of this very thing. He said, in the last days, we will become unforgiving 
Pharisees, and we will become lovers of self, the misguided missionary. And either one, frankly, is self-indulgent. Either one is focused on me, but the lawgiver, the Pharisee, is saying, look at me. Look at what I do and copy that because I'm all that. I've got it together. I've got it right. And I don't want anyone to do less than what I'm doing. And maybe I'm a little bit bitter. Maybe I'm a little bit bitter that I'm having to live this lifestyle and live in this rigid conformity, and I want you to have to live there with me. Woe be unto the Pharisee. But on the other extreme, I can love you so much that I love you to death, that I never allow you to grow, that I enable your sin. I enable your bad behavior. I enable your complacency. Woe be to those as well. You know, Jesus never lived in such extremes. Jesus was never given to self-indulgence. He never pointed to himself. He never held himself higher than anyone else. He never held himself above or below the law. In fact, he was filled with such grace and mercy that he humbled himself to the point of dying on a cross for us. Could we ever be that humble? Could we ever be so gentle and kind as to reach out to someone who's hurting, to reach out and say, I want to help you. You may be hurting. You may be in a mire of sin in your life. I may not like the way you look. I may not like the way you dress. I may not like the way you talk. I may not like the words you use. But I will love you. And I will help you. But I will never compromise the truth. That is the way that Jesus ministered. It was a heart of grace. And it was a heart of mercy and a heart of forgiveness that said, I want you to be changed because of what I know and who I know. How powerful, how powerful we could be as a church if we would learn each individually and corporately to walk in that kind of true grace and compassion. We have an obligation to minister as Christ ministered to confront evil wherever we see it. We have an obligation to offer uncompromising truth with heartfelt compassion, with pure motives, with generous forgiveness, that we, by walking in a power and an anointing greater than ourselves, might deliver a message that others would hear that we might demonstrate a lifestyle that other people would see, and we might demonstrate a power that they'd see that within us and say, I want what you have. Show me how to get that. Show me how to live that way. Show me how to bring forth the light that I see in you. What a powerful church we would be. True grace never excuses us from the law. It empowers us conform to God's law, but only mercy, not the laws imposed by man. They, the Spirit empowers us to conform to the laws of God in that Christ fulfilled the law, and we are conformed to put on or put on Christ, to wear His righteousness to wear His standard, live by His standard, His provision, and thereby become vessels of His holiness. In essence, grace empowers our relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And then true grace draws us into a deeper relationship with Him over and over again because it allows allows us to enter his throne room boldly, to receive that outpouring of His Spirit, to be filled up as purified and empty vessels so that we may go forth 
and share what we've been given. To empty out again, only to go to Him again and be filled up. To have that cup cleansed and renewed and refilled over and over again, only to pour out over and over again. I believe as we pursue Christ-likeness, as we pursue this grace empowerment, that it has to be a true pursuit. It has to be intentional. It's not going to just happen by osmosis. It doesn't just happen because we come in and sit in a congregation on Sunday morning. It doesn't just happen because we show up for Sunday school. And it doesn't just happen because we work in the kitchen or on the grounds or cleaning in the hallways or even teaching a class. It only happens when we pursue a true holiness, intentional holiness, pursuing God individually, one with Him. That comes through prayer. That comes reading of the Word. That comes getting before Him in repentance. It gets before Him in brokenness. You get before Him with an openness and say, God, where are you? Meet me here and show me what you would have me know. Let my heart know your heart. Let me become one with you. We talk about a divine romance, and a lot of men I know have trouble with that concept. But what we're talking about is not a love affair in terms of what you would think of husband and wife. We're talking about a love affair with God that is based in intimacy, oneness of heart, where we cannot tell our heart from His when we walk away, but it's all joined together. That's divine intimacy. That is where holiness grows. And that is where holiness erupts within us. And that is where holiness equips and empowers us to fulfill everything that God desires. When's the last time that you sought God's face and got lost? We have to understand that this loving God is a desperate pursuit. It has to be a desperate pursuit, especially now. We're so complacent. I, I get complacent. There's mornings I get up and I can spend an hour with God and it's this awesome time that it's like I can touch Him, I can smell Him, I can breathe Him, and I can hear Him. But then there's a lot of days that it seems so distant. He's distant. I'm distant. He didn't move. I moved. I got too busy. I got focused on other things. I got focused on Sherilyn things, what Sherilyn's heart wants, what Sherilyn's heart needs that day. Who messed with me that day? Who offended me yesterday? What do I need to say to this person that just keeps on needling me and bothering me? How do I build my financial nest over here? What banking do I need to do? All these things are things that can just separate us from God because they take our attention off Him and puts it on self. But I want you to think about being truly in love. Maybe thinking about Jessica and Larkin being engaged, ready to be married, and how much time and energy and focus they put on one another. And that's a good thing. And I think about being a mom or a grandmother. Think about when that first grandchild was born. How much attention you wanted to give that child. You wanted to know every inch. You wanted to know his face. You wanted to know his fingers. You wanted to see his toes. You wanted to kiss on him and love on him and hold him and squeeze him. And then you had to take nine billion pictures and share it with all your friends and say, look at this precious child. Look at this little face. Isn't that adorable? Look at my sweet mom. Let me tell you about it. What if we could love God that way? What if we could be so excited about Him as to want to share everything we know about Him, to touch Him, feel Him, look at Him, know His heart, and celebrate every transformation, every change, every aspect of growth that we see in ourselves, that we see in the body, that we see in His kingdom. 
that's where true intimacy dwells. And it's in that place, that place, that we will be empowered not only to receive these 300 people that are coming in, but to embrace them, to love them, to teach them, and to walk with them in their spiritual growth. Only to have them grow up and find the same kind of place with God and be empowered to go forth and be like that. That is what we're called to be as a church. That is what should be in our hearts. So I ask again, what's in your heart? Jesus said, those who are forgiven much, love much. What have you been forgiven? Some of us have been forgiven horrible things. Adultery, murder. Drunkenness, addiction. Some of us have also been forgiven horrible things, such as jealousy, envy, bitterness, selfishness, greed. What have you been forgiven? For those who are forgiven much, love much. I think about the woman who anointed Jesus' feet. How she covered his feet with her tears and she dried them with her hair. And she kissed all over his feet, adoring him. Oh, that we would go before God in such a manner. Acknowledging their beauty. Acknowledging our unworthiness. And yet so grateful to know that He has provided for that place of intimacy. How we love like He loves. I believe if we get real with ourselves and we look at what's really inside our hearts, we're going to find that there's some dirty places. We're going to find some cracks and some flaws and some stains. And I believe that it's in that realization we can go to God and say, cleanse me, make me whole, make me new, change my thinking. Most of all, change my focus. Instead of trying to strain those gnats out of every situation, may I focus on you and what you fix in me. And then may I love others as you love me unconditional, with forgiveness, with joy and thanksgiving and celebration of all that He is. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, we do acknowledge that You are almighty and all-powerful God, that You are a loving Father, that You have provided for us beyond what we can ever think, ask, or imagine, Father, that we forget, we are ungrateful, we forget how thankful we should be for what you have given us in your Son, Jesus. We forget, Lord God, that we have to be like him, to see his likeness and to see that relationship with you, that we might pursue holiness and be those cleansed people, those empty vessels through which you can work. So, Lord, I ask this morning, wherever we may be in light of your presence, in light of your likeness, Father, that you would change us still more into your image, more purified, more clean inside and out, that your light would be revealed through us, that your glory could be seen in all that we say, all that we do, all that we embrace. Father, that we would be that church that is not pharisaical, hypocritical. Father, that we would be not that church that is misguided and worldly, but Father, that we would be that church that is in tune in one with your heart. That we would have a heart like yours. That we would love you as Jesus. That we would love Jesus as the woman who anointed him. Forgive us, Father, for falling short. Father, we ask that you prepare us for the
what is to come, that we might embrace him as God and the truth of the gospel himself. And that we might be empowered to impart the kingdom to your mission. In Jesus' name.